Good evening. It is Wednesday, June 16th, 2021. Welcome to Bible Study Pal, the virtual midweek Bible study of the Palmyra Church of Christ in Palmyra, Indiana. I'm Greg Circle, the preacher for that congregation, and we are continuing our study of the book of Matthew uh, today. Uh, we're going to perhaps get through the fourth part, the current part that we're in, um, which is the part that deals with the battles of the kingdom. Uh, we may have to break it up into two parts, as you know, as I often do with my being a little long-winded sometimes. Uh, but we will we will strive to dig deep into the Word of God and see what it has to say for us today. So let's continue on with part four of the battles of the kingdom, and let's see what we read, starting in Matthew chapter twenty-one. In Matthew chapter twenty-one. Uh, we read about how the king rides into the battle. And I put battle in quotation marks for a very important reason. Let's read Matthew 21, 1 through 11, and figure out why. I do need to adjust some settings here. All right, here we go. When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethpage, Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gen uh, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them and brought the donkey and the colt, and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds uh, going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. So, the king rides into battle here, and he rides on a donkey. And that's the fun thing about uh, this king riding into battle. He's on a donkey, and a donkey, as... As Matthew points out, as the prophet points out, and I think the prophet is Zechariah. Yeah, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 talks about this. He is a beast of burden, or she is the beast, a beast of burden. A donkey is a beast of burden. And that's not the beast that you would, uh, you would expect a king to ride in on. You would expect a king to ride in on something a little more majestic, um, if you've ever seen a donkey trot along, it is not majestic. Um, you expect him to be on a horse. And that's really the way that most kings would prefer to ride into town. But sometimes, if the king had to enter in humility for some reason, perhaps the king needed to ask the monarch of this city, uh, the monarch who resided in that city, uh, if he needed to ask him a favor, he would come in in peace. And that's what a donkey was. A horse is an animal of war, and a donkey is an animal of peace. And so Jesus is riding in to Jerusalem. And that's the part I don't know that I emphasized when I first introduced this point, but Jesus is riding into Jerusalem it's in this verse, isn't it? And he's riding in on a donkey. He's riding in in peace. And it's peace from a particular standpoint. It's not like I had mentioned earlier in my example. It's not like he needs something from the reigning monarch in that city. But he is there. Uh, he is there for peace, not for war. But he's there for victory. He's already victorious. Now, even in, you know, in the human mind, 
you know, put yourself in the mindset of a king and you're going to say, well, even if I'm victorious, I'm victorious. I need to show my power and need to show why I was victorious. And I'm going to ride in on a horse. But Jesus is already victorious. He doesn't need to ride in on a horse. He doesn't need to show his power. And the way things are going to go, again, in the mind of man, it may not seem like Jesus is victorious, but he is. He is. He is already victorious. Um, I want you to think about how they use their coats. And if we can go to 2 Kings chapter 9 and verse 13, let's just go to all of chapter 9 and see if we can find some context here. Um, well, let's just read 11 through 13 and uh, see what that says. Now Jehu came out to the servants of his master, and one said to him, Is all well? Why did this mad fellow come to you? And he said to him, You know very well the man and his talk. They said, It is a lie. Tell us now. And he said, Thus and thus he said to me, Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Then they hurried, each, uh, they hurried, and each man took his garment and placed it under him on the bare steps and blew the trumpet, saying, Jehu is king. So, we look at we look at this, and this is an example of what's going to happen when Jesus walks in or rides in. Now, Jehu got to walk in on other people's coats, and you would understand. I mean, you might understand why people would put their coats down on the. This is a this is a king. You don't want him. You don't want his feet getting dirty, or even the feet of his animal. Uh, he needs to be perfectly clean. Um, he needs to look his absolute best. He needs to be pristine for his visit into this this city. So they were using their coats. So just as just as Jehu walked on the coats of the outer garments of those who were with him, uh, Jesus did the same. And it's also important to note that the folks who put down their coats did so voluntarily. It's not that, I mean, maybe they did it out of a sense of honor, a sense of uh, culture, but at the same, but they had to do it voluntarily, um, especially for Jesus. They were using their coats, but also uh, Matthew only says that they used branches, uh, but we read in other places, I think especially John, uh, they used palm branches specifically. And palm branches are a symbol of victory, just like Jesus is, I mean, he's showing. He is victorious. Uh, I have in here Isaiah chapter 62, verse 11, uh, for us to read. Um Let's, let's read verses 10 through 12 of that chapter. That's a full paragraph. Isaiah chapter 62, verses 10 through 12. And there we read, Go through, go through the gates, clear the way for the people. Build up, build up the highway, remove the stones, lift up a standard over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth. Say to the, say to the daughter of Zion, Lo, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And they will call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you will be called sought out, a city not forsaken. So in the middle of that is his reward is with him, his recompense before him. So this is the prophet looking to this time and saying, uh, well, well, I, I think it's the prophet looking, Isaiah looking to this time saying, Jesus is victorious. The, the, the servant, the suffering servant is victorious. This, this king is victorious as he comes into the city. It's, it's already happened. He's, he's bringing in, he has brought in his, his gifts, his rewards uh, for those who follow him. So he's already victorious. Um, and that's shown in these two ways. And then there's this. What is it that the people say? The people say, Hosanna. Hosanna. 
Now, what does that mean? What does Hosanna mean? Well, it means save, or it could also have that, if it's used as a substantive, as you know, like a noun, uh, I guess it could also mean savior. Um, but again, they're recognizing Jesus for who he is. He is the one who has come to save them. And, and he is victorious in that way as well. Now, not everybody... Not everybody sees Jesus as the Savior, um, but most of the crowd does. Verse 8, um, verse 8 says, Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. But there were crowds going ahead of him as well, so there were several crowds. Uh, but there were still many in the city who had to ask, who is this? Who is this? And those who were with him, those who were, uh, who were marching with him, who were crying out Hosanna, uh, who were crying out for Jesus to save, they were answering, this is Jesus, the prophet Jesus. So Jesus is regarded as a prophet. And no, many people who are religious, uh, even outside of Christianity, will say that Jesus was a prophet. But he's not a mere prophet. Uh, I think even Muslims will believe, will say that Jesus was a prophet. But he's not a mere prophet. Um, he's not just a good person, as so many others would say. Jesus is not only good, he's not only a prophet, but he is the Son of God, uh, and he is riding into Jerusalem at this point victorious. And again, we all know the story uh, and what's going to happen, and it seems like there's still a battle to be fought, and indeed you might say there is, but I think, you know, we could probably parallel what Paul said to Timothy, uh, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. That's that's Jesus' mindset right here. Um, there might still be one point that he says, well, I know there's still this one point where he says, uh, if you will, let this cup pass from me, but he still doesn't want to go through with it, but he's come this far. He is victorious. He is recognized as the prophet uh, who he is, he's recognized as the king, riding in on the donkey, on the animal of peace. Uh, and so he continues uh, the battle. Uh, he, as he's riding in to town, there's, there's still a fight that needs to happen. There's still a couple of fights that need to happen. And so he, and I'm going to break this up a little bit as we read it, but uh, he he has this battle against hypocrisy. If we go look at verses 12 through 46, well, let's, let's break it up a little bit. And let's see, in this battle against hypocrisy, uh, he battles against gross commercialism in the temple. In verses 12 and 13 of Matthew chapter 21, and, Je and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. So when we look at um, what is going on in the temple right now, I mean, some of it is described here by Matthew. Uh, There were those who were buying and selling in the temple. There were those who were changing money, uh, converting money from, you know, the foreign uh, denominations, the foreign, not denominations, but foreign currency into the, the local currency, um, the currency of the temple that they said, this is the way it has to be. Uh, they said, this is... These are the sacrifices you have to make. And yes, I realize that God said these are the sacrifices that you had to make. Uh, but it's my understanding from what I've 
what I've read that the priests of the time went a step further. It's not just, you know, these are the particular animals that you have to sacrifice, but, you know, as in this is the particular species that you have to sacrifice. They were saying these are the specific animals, the specific individual animals that you, one of these you have to buy from us and sacrifice, uh, which, you know, might not be anything wrong with, except what you have is this captive, uh, this captive customer. And it's kind of like, uh, I guess an example would be a, a little bit, you know, less of an, ex I mean, not a perfect example. We're talking about a different situation here, but you're not allowed to bring in outside food or drinks to movie theaters or, uh, you know, a lot of places that sell their own concessions. Um, you're not allowed to do it. Uh, and why is that? Because they have concessions to sell you. They have food to sell you at extremely inflated price. So uh, that's exactly what was happening here. Uh, now, you might, I mean, they would say, well, these people are coming from so far out, they can't bring their own stuff with them. And God, I think, made a provision for that in the Old Testament. I should have looked that up. But, I mean, you come and you, you, know, you can buy in town, you can buy in Jerusalem and then take it to the temple. But, no, they were saying, no, th these are the approved sacrifice, sacrificial animals. Um, and charging an inflated rate. And the money changers, well, they were changing money. I mean, you, you bring in your U.S. dollars, that's not going to do you any good in the, in the temple. Uh, so you're going to have to convert your U.S. dollars, and the converters are going to charge a fee for that, an exorbitant fee, because you have to do this in the temple currency. And Jesus said, no, this, this is not right. You all are robbing people. Of course, uh, you know, my, the money changers would be committing usury, which they weren't supposed to do according to the Old Testament law. And so they were breaking the law in that. Uh, probably breaking the law even with the animals as well. So Jesus then, I mean, flips over the tables. He's mad. He's angry. And I think this is the second time this has happened. I think even I think Matthew even mentions the first time too. Um, but he is, I mean, but this commercialism in the temple is hypocrisy, and, and Jesus is battling that, and he, as soon as he comes in as the victorious king, he goes straight for it. That's the first thing he goes to. Uh, the next thing that we read about is in verses 14 through 17, and he's fighting the hypocrisy of uh, those who are around but don't like what he's doing. In verses 14 through 17, uh, the blind and lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Yeah, there we go. That was something done that was in out in the open and they could uh, they could see it. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, i.e. healing the blind and lame, and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they become indignant. They became indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise for yourself? And he left and went out of the city to Bethany and spent the night there. So in the crowds that were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna in the highest, uh, in that crowd were even children who were joining in. Uh, they knew what was happening, and you know they the Pharisees didn't like it. Despite seeing what Jesus was doing, hearing what how everyone was reacting, they're not joining in though. How Jesus illustrates hypocrisy is with this figless tree, this tree that should have fruit on it, but it doesn't. And this is exactly uh, how um, this is exactly how 
Jesus views, I think, at least this is how the Holy Spirit, who inspired Matthew to write these things, write in this order. Uh, this is how, let's put it this way, God views the scribes and the Pharisees here. He views them as this figless tree, and this is what's going to happen to him as well. Let's read verses 18 through 22. Now in the morning, when he was returning to the city, he became hungry, seeing a lone fig tree by the road. He came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to it, No longer shall there ever be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. Seeing this, the disciples were amazed and asked, How did the fig tree wither all at once? And Jesus answered and said to them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And all things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Now, a couple of fun points with this. This is an illustration. This is an illustration that Jesus is giving. And and I want to consider something with this illustration. So first of all, let's understand what's going on. Um, I suppose, I guess, it's my understanding, I should say, that uh, when the fig tree is, you know, has its leaves, it should have already had fruit on it. The fruit should be ready about this time. I guess it's an early fruit. I'm not sure exactly how it works. Um, but Jesus is expecting to see fruit on this tree. Otherwise, the illustration makes no sense, right? Uh, but he doesn't see fruit. And that's kind of the way it is with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, isn't it? That's the way it is with hypocrites. They're supposed to be, I mean, they're showing, they're showing their godliness, their righteousness. They're showing their adherence to the law, but what fruit are they bearing? None. There's no fruit that, that they're showing, that, that they're bearing. There, there's nothing healthy about these trees. And so what does Jesus do? He curses the figless tree. And that's basically what he's going to do with those who are hypocrites. Uh, the scribes, the Pharisees of this time. And there's something interesting that Jesus says here. The, the disciples ask, how did this happen? And Jesus then kind of answers it in a, in a weird way, at least in my mind. The way is, he answers it is he says, you're going to be able to do this too. Now, not necessarily the fig trees, not just with trees and mountains. And I think, you know, I always used this parable or, yeah, or this teaching of Jesus, this verse and, and the verses that are similar to it. Um, you know, I always used it to talk about faith and, you know, the faith to move mountains is a faith to, to get in and work, which, you know, probably is true. And uh, what is it? Some philosopher said that uh, the way to carry away a mountain is by starting with, the way to start carrying away a mountain is with the first stone or something like that. Um, so you, you, you got to get to work if you want to move a mountain. But I also con consider what Jesus says um, in other places and, and what happens in throughout the book of Acts. Uh, they're going to go before kings. They're going to go before these powerful people, these strong people. They're, they're going to go against these mountains. And it's not just the fig trees that are going to be cursed. It's not just the hypocrites that are going to be cursed. But these mountains are going to be moved. They're going to be cast into the sea. There's going to be people who are in high places, who are who are very powerful, politically powerful, uh, who are in high positions, and they're going to believe from what the apostles say. Uh, Jesus talks about how they're going to, you know, they don't have to worry about what they're going to say because they're going to have the Holy Spirit inspire them to, to give an answer. Well, even we as Christians, we may not, have the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but we do have 
his word. We have his Bible that we can study and that we can put in our minds and we can understand and and hopefully wield, wield well uh, in battle, in, in battle of thought. Um, so, and convince people who think they are these tall, majestic mountains. Um, people who are convinced that they are the most righteous. And we'll be able to say to them, look, this is what the scriptures say, and they'll wilt. Or, in the case of the uh, those who are who think of themselves as majestic, they'll be in cast into the water. Uh, they'll be buried in baptism. I think that that's an interesting way to look at it. I mean, that I think that's the way we could look at it. Uh, so that's the illustration of the figless tree, and that illustrates what Jesus is going to do with the Pharisees and Sadducees and the like. He then continues. Uh, in verses 23 through 27, the by dealing with the hypocrites in his battle against them, uh, 23 through 27, where do we get that idea of we do not know? Let's see here. Verse 23, when he entered the temple, the chief priests, the elders of the people came to him while he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? First of all, I want to. They're talking about the things he's doing, uh, not necessarily the things he's teaching, but that might be included in the doing. Why? Why are you? Why are you doing this? Why are you teaching this way? Um, but also, even the healing. Uh, I think that kind of misses the point, does it? He is healing. Uh, not sure what they're thinking, but anyway, moving on. Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John was from what source? From heaven or from men? And they began reasoning among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, then why did you not believe it? But if we say from men, we fear the people, for they all regard John as a prophet. In answering Jesus, they said, We do not know. He also said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So, a couple of interesting points with, with this paragraph. Um, I always, you know, I think when we would be in a, in a discussion like this, uh, Jesus asks, Jesus says, If you answer my question, I'll answer yours. Um, we might say, well, what does that have to do with anything? What does what does John the Baptizer's teaching have to do with your authority? But I guess that's it, isn't it? That's it. Whose authority was the baptism of John by? Was it by heaven's authority, or was it just some man's authority? Whose authority? Did John the baptizer have? Well, to answer that question is to answer Jesus' question because John the baptizer pointed to Jesus. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so Jesus said, Look, if you were listening to John, you would know this. But I think the point is they're saying we do not know, which is not quite correct, is it? Um, they do. Well, they know what they think. They know what they believe about John the baptizer. But they know that's the wrong answer for the crowd, for reason of the crowd. Uh because if they probably did not believe that John the baptizer was sent from heaven, that the baptism of John was authorized by heaven. They probably don't believe that. So they believe it's authorized by some man, even if it is John the baptizer himself. But if they said that, what would happen? Well, they fear the people. They feared the people. Everybody was saying, the crowds were saying, Jesus is a prophet. 
They saw John the baptizer as a prophet, which he was, but they didn't. But they can't answer what they really think. And that's kind of the way hypo hypocrisy is, isn't it? When you get down to the, you know, where the rubber meets the road, I suppose you could say, um, when you get down to the to that point, there's going to come a time when the hypocrite says, I don't know, because they don't believe the truth, the actual truth, the objective truth, but on the other hand, it's inconvenient actually say what they really believe, it's inconvenient for them. And so they have to say, we don't know. We don't know. Well, hypo hypocrisy at its, at its core. Which son are you? Well, forgive me, I had to drink a little bit of water. I got a tickle in my throat. Still there. Um, which son are you? Well, Jesus tells a parable in verses 28 through 32. Um, and, and he applies it to those who are there. Let's read. But what do you think? A man had two sons. So Jesus just said, I'm not going to tell you what authority I came from or what authority I'm doing these things from. But here's, what, here's how he really answers them. A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he regretted it and went. The man came to the second and said the same thing, and he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. And you, seeing this, did not even feel remorse afterwards so as to believe him. So, again, Jesus dealing with the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and Sadducees who are addressing him. And, you know, he gives them this parable of two sons, of one that is initially rebellious, but then goes and does the work anyway. Kind of reminds me of uh, one of the little one's favorite stories right now. Yama, Yama, mess, mess, mess. Uh, where little Yama uh, is asked to clean his room and he shakes his head, no. <laughs> favorite line in the book, why is mama making noise? My favorite line in the whole book, why is mama making noise? And that's how this first son saw the father. You're just making noise, pops. I ain't doing nothing. But then he said, eh, yeah, I will. Just like little Yama does, where he sees all the mess that mama makes. And he says, eh, yeah, I need to help clean up. So, but this this son says, okay, I will go out to the vineyard. I will work. And that's what the Pharisees, or that's what the, sorry, the tax collectors and prostitutes do there. Is Jesus saying that they're right? No. They're not living proper lives, or at least prostitutes aren't. And, you know, in some ways, the the uh, tax collectors might not be either. Uh, being tax collectors, I mean, their their whole livelihood is almost, is first of all, based on theft, but also what they can get out of the job is because they have the ability to uh, thieve, to, to tack on to the theft um, even more, and they get to keep the, you know, keep the change, as it were. Um, but those who believe John, the baptizer, they believed his authority was from heaven, that the baptism of John was from heaven, yeah, they, they followed along, and they became that first son, and they went into the vineyard. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and those who were leading the Jews at the time, uh, what does he say about them? They're the second son. They're the second son who you know, says, yeah, I'll go do that, and then turns around, sits in his 
in his room and plays his video games instead of doing what the father said to do. Um, that's what they were doing. They looked nice. They, they said, yeah, I'll do it. But then they don't. They don't do what's right. They don't follow God. So I asked the question on the slide, which son are you? And that's something we all need to think about. We all need to think about, are we the son that's rebellious initially and then says, well, I do need to work? Or are we the son that says, yeah, 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 I can do that. I can do that. I can work. I'll go out to the vineyard. Yeah, I'll do it later. We never do. Which son are you? Uh, think about being the first one who actually does what he's supposed to do, what God asks him to. All right. The next paragraph, the next paragraph, they think that they're in control. Uh, we go to verses 33 through 41. We read Jesus saying, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. The vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. Again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. But afterward, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him and seize his inheritance. They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? They said to him, He will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper season. Now, I wonder, I wonder what they're thinking Jesus is meaning here. I wonder if they're thinking about the Romans. That's that the uh, the vineyard. The vineyard does, I think, mean Jerusalem. It, it's representing Jerusalem here, um, and God has kind of rented, if you will, this area out to first the. After you know, after the Jews took over, after the Hebrews took over, and then things got rough. Uh, the Assyrians came in, took over the northern kingdom. Then the Babylonians came in. That's when they conquered Jerusalem. Uh, so he rented it out to the Babylonians, and then the Persians, Medes and Persians, came in, and then the Greeks came in. Now the Romans are here, and everybody knows that the Romans, uh, the Romans aren't going to. You know, once they come and take over, they they're not they're not going to let it go. So if they were to see the son of the landowner coming in, they would dispatch him immediately and take over. And then the the scribes and Pharisees are saying, "Yeah, yeah, he's talking about the Romans here." I don't know why they would think that, but that's the only thing I can figure because they answer pretty pretty. Uh, With a lot of gusto, I suppose, uh, saying that he, he's going to bring these wretched wretches to a wretched end, and then he'll rent out. He'll rent it out to us. He's going to give us back the kingdom. He's going to give us back the vineyard. Um, that, I think that might be what they're thinking. Um, but really, Jesus is pointing this parable at them, which they realize a little bit later. We'll read that when we come to it. Um, he's pointing out them. They're the wretched wretches that are going to come to a wretched end. They're the ones who, and Jesus had said this before, you've killed the prophets. You whose fathers had killed the prophets, you're just like them. Um, and so Jesus is saying to them, you know, that they're the ones who, when they see the Son, they're going to 
they're going to dispatch him, as I put it, the euphemism I used. Um, the father thinks that surely they will respect the son, the one who, well, for all intents and purposes, owns the land. Um, but nope, they don't. And they think that they, they're in control. They think that they're the ones that will that can handle it, that... Um, That, that will make money from this vineyard. But Jesus is victorious no matter what. The Son is victorious no matter what. And I think that's the lesson of 42 through 44. After they respond the way they do, Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone, and came about this came from this came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it, the fruit of the kingdom. And he who fail or who falls on this stone will be broken in pieces, but whomever it falls on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. So, no matter what, no matter what, Jesus is victorious um, in this battle of hypocrisy. You know, there's this stone, it's perfect. Jesus is perfect, and the builders rejected it. Those who were trying to build the city, those who were... Uh, who were given this vineyard to take care of, they, they rejected Jesus. And so the, the kingdom of God was going to be taken away from them. God was going to take his kingdom from them. He was going to bring those wretched wretches to a wretched end. And instead of them having the kingdom, those who are not producing any fruit, those who are figless trees, a people who were not a people, those who are unified in God, in Jesus, they're the ones who are going to receive the kingdom. Uh, and when the people heard it, they... Well, when the scribes and Pharisees heard it, they, of course, didn't like what they heard. Everybody recognized Jesus as a prophet. Matthew concludes this chapter by saying, When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parable, they understood that he was speaking about them. When they sought to seize him, they feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet. So just like with John the baptizer, they... They knew what the people thought of him. They didn't agree, but they knew what would happen if they did something against this person uh, whom, whom the people thought were, was a prophet. And so they couldn't do anything. They could do, they could do nothing. But that would all change. That will all change, of course, in chapters we are in the last week of Jesus life and it's it's interesting that this is the week that uh, I think all four of the gospel writers spend the most time on because it is so important it's it's Jesus it's really Jesus final battle um, that he's fighting for the kingdom and uh, it is and, and this, this battle that he's just completed here is the battle against hypocrisy. And the thing about the, the battle against hypocrisy is it's something that we even battle today. Uh, it's, it's a battle that continues. Uh, Jesus is victorious, but there's always... I mean, he came into Jerusalem victorious. He came in with his reward in front of him, um, Isaiah said. But at the same time, there are people who still reject him. He, he's, he's, he lays it open. 
he says, this is the reward if you only take it. Uh, but so many people won't. So many people won't. Uh, and they won't for many reasons, but one of the reasons you'll hear is oh, something about hypocrisy. There's, there's so many hypocrites in the church. And it is something that perhaps we may battle. We may battle internally. We may battle against our internal hypocrisy. Um, but we also have to battle the hypocrisy on the outside as well, just like Jesus did here. Jesus did with the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, a lot of these problems that we see, a lot of these fronts, if you will, um, that that we see in this chapter, they're, they're still being fought today. Uh, commercialism in the temple, uh, you know, what, what are people, what are the people in the church focusing on? Uh, I know, I know politics is real strong right now. There's a lot to argue about with politics. Um, I think when you when you go to some places, you're going to see even even what you see what we what Jesus saw in the temple. You're going to see commercialism. Um, and that's not the way it ought to be. It's not something that we you know, commercial. We're not drawing people in with a product. We're drawing people in with the gospel. You know, can we use things to kind of say, hey, this is some interesting way that we have got to teach the gospel, but we have to teach the gospel. That that's what that's what the church is all about. Um, you know, the church isn't about gimmicks. It's it's about the gospel. Um, you know, again, a lot of these things we might even, we might see today. There might be people who see and hear, and still say no, thank you. They they know. They do know, but they don't want to give up. They don't want to give up what they have, thinking that that's going to carry them through to the end, and it won't. They might carry them through to the end, but it won't go beyond that. God offers us, Jesus offers us, a more abundant life. He offers us a reward that goes on, a reward that is incorruptible and undefiled and reserved in heaven for you who are protected by God. First Peter chapter 1, or maybe Second Peter chapter 1. Anyway, one of Peter's letters, how he begins it. But he offers that to those who will follow him. He offers it to those who say, Hosanna, save. Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Do you want to call on Jesus for salvation? Do you want to no longer be a hypocrite, but instead see and hear what Jesus does? And say, yeah, I, I want to join in in that call. Listen to what Jesus says. Hear it, repent of your sins, confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and be immersed to have your sins washed away. And if we can help you with that, we want to uh, encourage you to join us at, uh, if you're in Palmyra, 14175 Green Street Northeast uh, in Palmyra, that's just south of the four-way intersection on, on Indiana 135. Uh, we meet Sunday mornings at 9.15 for Bible classes and 10 a.m. for our worship service. We hope you join us then. We also have a 5 p.m. worship service, and soon, not sure when yet, but soon we will be starting back our in-person midweek Bible studies. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how things work out with that. Uh, if you have any questions, you can also call us at 812-364-6215 and leave a voicemail on the church's answering machine, or you can email me at preacher at palmyrachurchofchrist.org. You can also leave your comments down below in the comment section, or visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash palmyra.churchofchrist, and uh, we'd be glad to answer any questions that you have. If uh, there's nothing else, we will 
fade to black, have a prayer, and be virtually dismissed. Heavenly Father, we're, we come to you this evening thanking you for the beautiful day that we've had, and we pray, Father, that as uh, people hear the words of your great book, the, the story of Jesus, that they will uh, understand his power in their lives, they will understand the victory that he has over all the world, and that they can participate in that victory. They can take that victory that he gives uh, by following him. We pray that uh, all those who here are encouraged to do so, and those of us who are already following him, we pray that uh, we will be we be more faithful. We will cry out Hosanna even louder, even louder. We ask, Father, that you'll be with those who need you at this time, those who are sick, those who are uh, suffering in many ways. We pray uh, your blessings and comfort on them. Help us to be there for them in whatever way they need. We ask, Father, that you'll be with those who uh, who are taking care of so many who are sick, and we pray that uh, those who are sick will will recover their health and rejoin their families. We ask, Father, that you'll be with us throughout our lives and forgive us of our sins. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.